Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second of the National Productivity Series. I am Ruby Badilias, your moderator for this session. Hi, Ruby. Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Valenzuela, and I'll be your co-moderator for this session. You know, Ruby, we had a full house last week. Our first webinar series was opened by Secretary Silvestre H. Bellio III. I heard that the Zoom webinar slots were full and there were 7,000 plus Facebook Live viewers. Under Secretary Rosemary G. Edelon of the National Economic Development Authority presented, presented Recharge PH. Recharge PH seeks to focus, sharpen, sharpen the design and accelerate the implementation of programs under the 2020 general appropriations. It aims to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and help get the Philippine economy recover from the sharp decline in the second quarter of the year. Today, uh, we have a resource person who will be presenting an equally interesting topic. As a background, the promotion of productivity is one of NWPC's twin mandates together with the minimum wage determination. Part of our advocacy is convening national productivity conferences, which we have been doing since the year 2010. This year, because of the global crisis created by this pandemic and its impact on our lives and our work, we have aptly themed this virtual conferences, conference today as driving productivity in the better normal. It recognizes the need to deepen our understanding of the challenges brought by this pandemic and the policy and program responses to leverage the opportunities and to bounce back with greater resilience and efficiency to unlock and drive productivity in the new normal. Now, given this theme, we have lined up webinars every Thursday from September to November on topics covering the country's plan for a healthier and resilient better normal, government programs to accelerate automation of industries, the employment outlook post-COVID, the future of our work, business responses to new normals such as the use of actionable intelligence, automation, business reconfiguration, and employee engagement. Just a few house rules before we start. We will turn your videos off and keep your audios on mute while the session is ongoing to minimize interruptions. We encourage you to answer the poll questions that will be flashed on your screens. Q&A and chat boxes are available at the bottom of the screen for your questions, comments, or feedback. And please make sure that you complete the evaluation form after the session to get your certificate of participation. To be more engaging, we now invite you to answer the poll questions to tee off the discussion. Please pull up the first poll question. The first question is, what is your company's biggest automation challenge or hurdle? Your choices are cost of automation, level of knowledge and skills, weak or no access to technology or innovation, impact on employment, or others. You may press end polling once you're done. Please pull up the second question. The second question is, what do you think are the benefits to your company of automating your processes? Your choices are speed up processes, improve product quality, reduce costs, improve productivity, or others.
please pull up the third poll question. The third question, at what stage of automation is your company in? Your responses are not started, planning stage, launch automation, fully automated, or don't know or uncertain. Please pull up the fourth and final poll question. The question is, what forms of assistance do you need from government to jumpstart automation of your systems and processes? You may have multiple choices and your possible answers are training or capacity building, access to digital technology, credit or loan assistance, or access to global markets and knowledge networks. Thank you. We will show the results after the presentation of our resource person. And now to present automating workplaces in a better normal, let us welcome under, the Undersecretary for Competitiveness and Innovation of the Department of Trade and Industry, Undersecretary Rafaelita M. Aldaba. May I share my screen? Good morning, Yusek. Good morning. Okay. Let me just uh, fix my <laughs> fix my presentation. Okay. Um, a very good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to the National Wages and Productivity Commission. Um, it's always a, pre a, a pleasure to uh, be part of uh, your activities. And today, I'm going to discuss the importance of automating workplaces in a better normal. And um, prior to this unprecedented crisis, we were already experiencing the entry of um, Industry 4.0 technologies. For instance, in the services sector, uh, we've witnessed the emergence of uh, new business models like Grab, Uber, and in the Philippines, we have uh, Ancas, um, GrabFood, Lalamove, for retail, uh, it's Amazon, Alibaba, Zalora, Shopee, Lazada, then you have Netflix for TV and film, and uh, Airbnb for accommodation. And all this disrupted the traditional way of delivering services. In manufacturing, uh, traditional uh, manufacturing is uh, being disrupted as operations are undergoing digital transformation to Industry 4.0 using technologies like artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning or ML, big data analytics, cloud computing, 3D printing towards smart manufacturing, smart factory, and smart products. For example, home assistants like Alexa or um, Hey Google to play music, turn on the lights to cook, and other things we can ask them to do. So um, this is what I'm uh, planning to do in the first part of the presentation. Um, just to provide you with, a, with an overall context, I would briefly discuss Industry 4.0 and its implications. Then I will be sharing the results of an Industry 4.0 um, survey on the readiness of industries, followed by Industry 4.0 strategies and the plans and programs of the government. Okay. 
Okay. So uh, as you can see in the slide, in the first industrial revolution, um, mechanization emerged from the discovery of steam power and water. In the second industrial revolution, there was mass production through assembly line and discovery of electricity. In the third industrial revolution, we had automation through electronics and IT. And in the fourth industrial revolution, which evolved from the third industrial revolution technologies, like for instance, in terms of the hardware, we have automation and robots. And um, all this we uh, already had in the past. And what makes the fourth industrial revolution different is the machine's connectivity, flexibility, and functionality in executing tasks. They are also able to collect data and transmit this data through the industrial internet of things. And with big data analytics, processing of vast quantities of data in near real time becomes possible. Um, and the fourth industrial revolution is based on cyber physical systems, the merging of the physical and virtual worlds. And these virtual uh, worlds are smart network systems with embedded sensors, processors, actuators um, that are designed to sense and interact with the physical world and support in real time. So what are the implications of this uh, new technologies. According to McKinsey, AI techniques and solutions have the potential to create from uh, 3.5 trillion US dollars to 5.8 trillion US dollars in value across 19 industries, which uh, is led by retail. Of course, um, this is especially true for uh, e-commerce and then transport and logistics, travel, healthcare systems and services, consumer packaged goods, uh, auto and assembly and other high-tech industries. Um, in another report, uh, this was from uh, Accenture, this is uh, fairly recent. Um, based on this report, AI is likely to be most substantial in uh, marketing and sales, as well as in supply chain management and marketing. Um, the report also conducted a survey and based on uh, the responses that they got, two thirds of business leaders are actually expecting to deploy AI in order to increase revenues up to 30%. And uh, companies who successfully adopted AI reported a 300% growth on return to AI investments. And hence it's really very important uh, for us to look at uh, Industry 4.0 technologies as an opportunity for the country to upgrade um, into digital industrialization. Of course, there are, there are challenges and uh, we'll be discussing those uh, in a little while. Now, um, we know that the COVID-19 global pandemic has been disrupting lives, economies, and societies as uh, the health crisis actually turned into an economic crisis. So now more than ever, we realize the importance of adopting Industry 4.0 technologies. They have played a crucial role in keeping societies functional in times of quarantines or lockdowns. Without these technology, new technologies, uh, it would be difficult to have these online meetings, webinars, and uh, work from home arrangements. And uh, what we've seen, what we're seeing is that um, the pandemic has actually accelerated the use of technologies like digital payments, telehealth, and robotics. In the C4.0 would also be needed as we restart the economy and as we build resilience and prepare for the new normal and post-crisis future. On the slide, you can see the different uh, applications of uh, um, this in the C4.0 technologies, but we won't anymore discuss this in the interest of time. Uh, for those who would be interested, we can uh, distribute uh, copies of the PowerPoint. Next, um, for the employment impact of Industry 4.0, McKinsey found that 48% of uh, activities in the Philippines, and that's equivalent to 
18.2 million jobs could be automated, 6 million in agriculture, 3.4 in retail, and 2.4 in manufacturing. And similarly, the, um, the Asian Institute of Management showed that uh, agriculture, forestry, and fishing has the highest probability of jobs being automated. At, uh, as you can see on the chart, it's at 90%, which is the highest. And uh, financial insurance has a probability of 79%. Mining and quarrying, 78%. Construction is at 76%, while accommodation and food service is at 72%. For manufacturing, it's somewhere in the, um, somewhere along, uh, it's about 65%. Uh, Public administration, it's 40%. Uh, this is where uh, government uh, uh, institutions belong or government workers are here. So the probability is. Uh, relatively low of uh, um, workers in public administration being automated. Um, human health, uh, it's also low at 33%, and the lowest is uh, education, which is at 15%. So in, in, in both of these um, studies, the message is it's the low skilled, the low educated and routinized uh, jobs that are uh, most vulnerable to the adverse effect of technological change. But note, I have another study on uh, the right-hand side. This was from uh, PwC, and it indicated that AI and other related technologies have two effects. One is the displacement effect, and the other is the income effect. And it is, according to this uh, study, it is through these effects that uh, jobs are being destroyed and created due to the adoption of AI and other related uh, technologies. And as you can see on the figure, the cost savings from the use of AI and robots would allow firms to lower their prices, which would in turn increase consumers' real income and spending, thereby increasing the demand for goods and services. And this then forced uh, would force firms to hire more workers as firms expand their capacity. So uh, in looking at uh, the impact of AI, we need to balance these uh, two effects, no? uh, the um, displacement and uh, income effects. Although uh, in most of the studies that I've seen, the net effect is, uh, is positive. And um, this is confirmed by the earlier uh, uh, results that I've uh, shown you earlier. Okay, um, so to see how jobs uh, uh, are uh, evolving uh, in the Philippines, ah, wait, wait, not, not in the Philippines first, but um, let me note that uh, automation and uh, AI uh, technologies will accelerate the shift in skills that the workforce needs. Like what we've said, um, this uh, these new technologies would create new skills and new roles. And what we're seeing is that the demand for advanced uh, technological skills, such as programming, will grow rapidly given the increasing need for machine and human interaction. Um, social, emotional, and higher cognitive uh, skills like creativity, critical thinking, and complex information processing we'll also see growing demand. Demand for uh, digital skills will continue to accelerate while the demand for physical and manual skills will uh, decline. And this uh, we've also seen earlier. So now let's look at uh, how these uh, digital jobs are uh, evolving in, in the Philippines. Um, and uh, this is uh, a report from LinkedIn LinkedIn 2020 Emerging Jobs uh, Report, which uh, shows that the digital economy is actually driving the country's uh, emerging jobs. And as you, noting, noting from uh, those different uh, jobs that uh, are seen on the, on the slide, it's uh, software engineers and developers that are going to be critical for businesses uh, that uh, are pursuing digital transformation, okay? 
Now, looking closely at Philippine industries, most are still in the process of transition from industry 2.0 to 3.0, but there are some that are already taking steps towards digitalization and smart manufacturing. And industries such as auto and electronics are still in the labor intensive stage. Um, ITBPM is largely dominated by BPOs and call centers where tasks could easily be replaced by machines. And, and uh, in agriculture, uh, we are still in the mechanization phase. But uh, there are companies like Toyota, BMAC, Epson, NIDEC, and Taiyo that are already starting to innovate and plan to shift uh, uh, to Industry 4.0 technologies and products, okay? So, um, well, at this point, I would be sharing with you the results of a technology utilization survey that we conducted last year. Well, some of the questions are uh, uh, quite similar with those that uh, you were asked to respond uh, earlier. Now, um, this uh, survey aims to help us understand the Industry 4.0 readiness of our firms and industries. The survey tool that we used was provided by uh, the Manufacturing Enterprise Solutions Association, or MESA. This is a, a worldwide, not-for-profit community of manufacturing, IT suppliers, systems integrators, and other related companies. The aim is to improve uh, business results and production operations through optimized application of IT and best management practices. Um, as you can see on the slide, the survey assessed eight technology dimensions in the manufacturing operations of a company. And um, this is based on a self-assessment by the company. And the ratings are one to five, with one being the lowest, meaning there's no utility. Uh, technology utilization, while five is the highest, meaning um, um, it, it has the highest level of technology utilization, applying all these uh, new technologies. And the highest score or the perfect score is 40. Okay, so these are the, on the slide, you can see the, very, uh, the eight dimensions that were assessed. Uh, planning and scheduling, manufacturing activity management, equipment connectivity and uh, data management, material management and handling, equipment maintenance, shop floor visibility, quality, and um, cybersecurity. Um, just to illustrate the uh, five levels in which a company uh, would be rating itself across the eight dimensions, like what I've said, there are five uh, uh, levels one, if uh, the firm is still uh, doing the activities manually, so purely manual. Two, uh, the firm is using spreadsheet management. Three, uh, the firm has standalone database management system with legacy, but with legacy applications. And number four, most manufacturing execution systems uh, use, uh, are already being used. Oh, and then five, uh, you are uh, already applying the Industry 4.0 technologies, all right, like big data, industrial internet of things, machine learning, uh, and robotics. And you combine it with your MES, or man manage, uh, Manufacturing Execution System. Okay, so um, we distributed 1,276 question questionnaires and we were able to retrieve 144. So we have uh, an 11% uh, response rate. And as you can see on the slide, uh, these are the characteristics of the respondent uh, companies. 70% were located in ecozones. 53% were foreign owned. 53% were large, but we also have 19% micro, 6% small, 22% medium-sized companies. And um, about half uh, were from Region 4A, which is uh, uh, the center of our manufacturing activities in, in the country. So next, uh, these are the results. Uh, for planning and scheduling, let me start with that. Uh, 44 out of uh, 144 companies or 31% uh, 
uh, start work orders based on demand, um, while uh, 6% uh, have work orders being carried out through advanced planning and scheduling system interfaced with uh, the manufacturing uh, execution system. And in terms of uh, manufacturing activity management, 53% control and track their manufacturing activities manually through a, a paper-based system. And in terms of uh, equipment connectivity and data management, 58% of uh, the respondents have no manufacturing equipment connected to the network. Um, for material management and handling, 44% uh, of the company's uh, raw materials are pulled into the shop floor via an unstructured request system. So they're using paper or email or through verbal instructions. Now let's look at the other uh, dimensions in terms of uh, equipment maintenance. 44% of the companies have no maintenance system in place and uh, repairs are being done uh, reactively. 60 uh, or 47% uh, managed and tracked maintenance through a standalone electronic maintenance management uh, system. Now, in terms of uh, shop floor visibility, 35% have uh, shop floor status provided via ad hoc reports, while 31% uh, uh, have uh, shop floor status pushed via scheduled report. In terms of quality, 35% uh, uh, have uh, document control. They also have corrective and preventive action or CAPA. And uh, data collection uh, is being done still using a paper-based uh, paper approach. 37% uh, uh, have uh, document control as well and data collection are done um, through Excel sheets but are not integrated with manufacturing systems. And this is different. The other one uh, uses still a uh, paper-based approach, the 35%. And looking at cybersecurity, 46% of the companies have no established cybersecurity procedures and programs. Okay, so on the overall, um, we, we now look at the um, scores, the distribution of the scores uh, across the different uh, sectors. Um, and what we see is that uh, the bulk of the companies uh, have very low to low technology utilization. So if level one is uh, zero, so meaning no technology utilization, two is very low technology utilization, level three is low, and then level four is high and level five is very high. And uh, for uh, micro enterprises, 65% have uh, uh, very low scores. 38% uh, among the small enterprises also uh, have uh, low uh, technology utilization. 67% of medium sized uh, companies have uh, very low meaning uh, Level, level two, okay? And 48% of large enterprises uh, also have uh, scores uh, falling between uh, 70 to 24, so that's considered low, meaning level two. And only 24% only uh, are, are um, falling in the high category, high technology utilization, and 8% uh, already in the very high uh, technology utilization category. Okay, so like what we've said, the highest score uh, that one can get is uh, 40. That is, if you're going to score yourself in all of the eight dimensions, you're giving yourself five, then you get um, the, the perfect score, 40. And um, looking at the results of uh, the surveyed companies, our average total score is 18. Um, and highest technology utilization is in uh, areas such as cybersecurity, quality, and manufacturing management. 
And the lowest uh, scores are in equipment maintenance and um, equipment connectivity and data management. So across the different manufacturing sectors, the highest technology utilization is in uh, uh, other non-metallic products, in paper and paper products, computer, electronic, and optical products, motor vehicles, and pharmaceutical uh, products. The lowest uh, technology utilization is found in uh, sectors such as textile, leather, beverages, wearing apparel, repair and installation of machinery, as well as food products, where we still have a lot of uh, labor intensive uh, activities. So um, moving on, um, in this uh, slide, um, let me just discuss with you uh, characteristics of uh, the manufacturers with high technology utilization. And what we found is that um, firms that are large, firms with high foreign equity, firms that are operating inside eco zones um, have the highest technology utilization scores. Micro and small um, enterprises have the lowest technology utilization scores relative to medium and large uh, enterprises. Now, in terms of uh, geographic uh, distribution, the highest technology utilization is still in NCR in Region 3 and Region 4A. Um, of course, we do not want the adoption of new technologies to widen the digital divide in the country. And hence, it's really important to provide the necessary digi digital infrastructure and digital support um, to our uh, companies uh, located outside of uh, uh, Metro Manila, Region 4A, and uh, Region 3. Now let me uh, also, uh, we, we, we added uh, a few uh, more questions to probe deeper into the uh, awareness as well as uh, the, the barriers and the plans of uh, the company uh, respondents. And what the results uh, showed is that the bulk of our enterprises are actually aware and they are familiar with uh, Industry 4.0 technology. For instance, 77% of micro said that they are open or familiar with Industry 4.0, 67% for small and medium enterprises, and 83% for large enterprises. And uh, as to the primary considerations for Industry 4.0 uh, transformation, the most important are improvement in productivity and competitiveness, uh, followed by cost of investment and funding, innovation, and technological advancement. So, um, okay, we also ask them what the barriers are to uh, Industry 4.0 transformation, and uh, what we've found are uh, financial capability uh, and um, market conditions and uh, our poor digital infrastructure. And to overcome these barriers, firms are actually formulating uh, their um, internal corporate strategies. They're looking at uh, uh, prospective loan applications and carrying out internal uh, R&D, okay? So uh, as you can see, if we try to relate uh, these findings with uh, the earlier results, what we see is that there's indeed a very high level of awareness. But uh, what we're seeing is, is that in terms of use, actual use, um, what we've found is that there's actually uh, very low uh, and, and low uh, technology utilization. And hence, uh, probably the reasons that could explain are uh, these uh, barriers that were cited by, by the companies. And, uh, Maybe also it's important for us to really provide more, um, more uh, information uh, in terms of uh, the very detailed uh, implications as well as what these uh, technologies would do uh, to, in terms of uh, the economic operations and the manufacturing operations of uh, our companies. Okay. Now, uh, these are the planned investments in the next five years. And what we're seeing is that 45% uh, of the surveyed enterprises would actually invest in machinery, in employee training, very important, as well as uh, software and infrastructure. 
And next, uh, now uh, let me also share uh, these uh, findings with you. HF, this is from HFS uh, research, which indicated that the top three industry 4.0 technologies that firms will likely um, increase their spending on in response to uh, the crisis uh, are cybersecurity, automation, and smart analytics. So um, in terms of uh, preparations for Industry 4.0, our neighboring countries all have ongoing programs. Indonesia has Making Indonesia 4.0, Malaysia's Industry Forward, and Thailand 4.0. And for the Philippines, our program is uh, the IQBS, or Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy. This uh, strategy aims to grow globally competitive and innovative industries. We, uh, we uh, focus on innovation, which is actually at the front and center of our new industrial policy. And the, as you can see on this slide, the framework is given by the relationship between competition, innovation, entrepreneurship, and productivity. And this would serve these uh, um, elements that uh, you, you see on the slide, would serve as channels through which investments, employment, and growth would be generated. So uh, just to illustrate this further, um, I'm sharing you this uh, uh, framework. Um, the adoption of uh, new technologies can lead to innovation through the creation of new products and services in the market, resulting in more quality jobs, higher incomes, emergence of new, new industries, as well as uh, uh, environmental goods. And with these uh, new technologies, we can adopt smart manufacturing, and hence uh, our production efficiency goes up, our competitiveness improves, which could lead to more efficient energy use, industrial competitiveness, and linkages to uh, supporting industries. All these are major steps that could lead, lead to uh, a more uh, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable industrial development. And this is uh, actually the framework of uh, the policies, that, uh, policies and programs that uh, we are implementing. The IQS has six major strategies. Number one, we are embracing Industry 4.0. We are developing innovative startups and uh, MSMEs. We are integrating our production system, strengthening innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, upskilling and reskilling our workforce, and um, improving our ease of uh, doing business. All these are, uh, we, we, we need to uh, have comprehensive programs if we want uh, our adoption of uh, Industry 4.0 technologies to be. Um, to be successful and help us realize our goal of uh, an inclusive, um, sustainable, and resilient industrial development. And we are pr prioritizing the following industries uh, and uh, activities. Uh, it, we have manufacturing, agriculture, fishery, and forestry, and the focus is on agribusiness, um, services, public utilities, as well as new technologies and innovation. Okay, we won't go through uh, the, the different industries anymore. There are 15 of them. Um, now, let me uh, also cite this, uh, this uh, uh, slide in terms of the plans uh, that uh, we are uh, uh, preparing. We are focusing on uh, technologies like uh, voice recognition, AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, robotics, 5G connectivity, although I know this is not yet um, here, and uh, industrial internet of things. By using these technologies, we can create new products or solutions in the following areas. Smart buildings and smart home technology, digital health, e-gaming, smart assistance, um, vehicle technology, resilient technology, audio, video, and uh, ed tech. Now, uh, why am I mentioning this? Uh, it's important because uh, uh, as we prepare as we, this industries, as we try to attract uh, more investments uh, that would go into these sectors, it's important that we are able to provide uh, the human resources, the workers 
uh, the, the skilled workers that would be demanded as these uh, industries grow and as we uh, pursue uh, digital transformation. Okay, so um, again, to share with you uh, some of uh, our programs on Industry 4.0, um, we are uh, actually working with uh, the UNIDO in crafting uh, Industry 4.0 roadmaps for electronics, for auto, aerospace, and uh, agribusiness. We are also conducting a feasibility study for the establishment of an Industry 4.0 um, SME Academy. Uh, this is going to provide uh, Industry 4.0 trainings to MSMEs along with uh, uh, the establishment of an Industry 4.0 pilot factory. We are also working with uh, the Asian Institute of uh, Management on the formulation of an AI uh, roadmap that would make the Philippines an AI center of uh, excellence. And then together with uh, DOLE and TESDA, we are uh, also working on uh, a human resource development roadmap in preparation for Industry 4.0. Okay, and um, other agencies such as DOST, um, uh, is, uh, DOST is also preparing uh, for Industry 4.0. They are building an advanced manufacturing center or AMSEN and an advanced mechatronics, robotics, and industrial automation laboratory or AMERIAL. And we look at these uh, facilities as, uh, um, uh, as the venues were um, trainings on Industry 4.0 would be conducted. Okay, so at the same time, uh, we are uh, seeking support for the implementation of this program, which we call SMART, Securing Manufacturing Revitalization and Transformation. And what this, this program aims to provide fiscal and non-fiscal assistance to companies that are shifting to Industry 4.0 uh, technologies. We are proposing a budget, uh, initial budget of uh, 30 billion pesos to support um, SMEs and large companies for a period of uh, two to three years. And the, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, we would like to uh, provide soft loans, grants, subsidies, incentives, and uh, other fiscal support along with uh, intellectual uh, property protection. And then next, we are building uh, our uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem in the regions through the Regional Inclusive Innovation Centers, which uh, would serve as platforms that would link together the different stakeholders um, in the ecosystem, like the universities, you have LGUs, uh, R&D labs, s and parks, MSMEs, startups, and others. And the focus is on addressing industry issues and societal problems, applying technolo technology uh, solutions. And currently, we are piloting these rigs in Davao, in CDO, in Cebu, as well as in uh, Legazpi. So um, the pandemic um, has uh, provided an impetus to fast track the adoption of Industry 4.0 technologies and innovation with greater focus on resilience and sustainability. Um, let me just uh, point out this uh, four points. Number one, um, this is already to uh, summarize uh, what we've discussed. Uh, the crisis has presented new Industry 4.0 technologies and opportunities that we can leverage to discover new, better, and more uh, resilient ways of doing things. Uh, new and powerful technologies such as AI, um, Internet of Things, blockchain, robotics, e-commerce, and digital trade will be shaping the high-tech, the contactless, no-touch e um, era of uh, the future. And what we are also witnessing now is that it's the enterprises which have greater innovation that are emerging resilient and are uh, able to record gains amid the economic uh, slowdown. And uh, what we uh, foresee is that Industry 4.0 will be playing an important role in the post-pandemic landscape. We need Industry 4.0 to ensure the survival of more companies, uh, to shorten the adaptation and recovery phase of businesses, as well as to provide platforms 
to help us develop new, more resilient products, processes, um, and systems in the medium to long term. And I guess uh, just to conclude, uh, we need to embrace Industry 4.0. We need to use and adopt uh, these new technologies to strengthen our competitiveness, as well as the sustainability of uh, industries. And th by doing this, uh, in order for us to realize this, of course, there is um, a lot of uh, government uh, policy support that would be needed, uh, such as investing in drivers of uh, demand for work, uh, fostering business uh, dynamism uh, along with uh, uh, data privacy and protection and then we uh, also need to um, innovate and integrate into uh, the digital economy industry clusters and the global collaboration um, in, and important would be um, investment incentives that would uh, enable more uh, investments in human capital to take place as well as uh, providing transition support and safety nets for workers who would be affected by, the, by this transition. Companies must also uh, begin their uh, digital transformation, ASAP, and uh, the academe uh, and training programs, uh, they need to adapt to, uh, to meet the demand for the talent that would be created by Industry 4.0, as well as to bridge the gap between basic research and commercialization. We need to um, evolve the education systems and learning for a changed uh, workplace and uh, move towards uh, um, improving our basic uh, STEM or STEAM if we want to include uh, arts um, through the school systems and improved on the job trainings. And new emphasis is needed on creativity, on critical and systems thinking, and adaptive and lifelong learning. And lastly, um, strong government academe industry collaboration would be key. That would enable us to uh, take advantage of the opportunities brought about by these uh, technological developments. But um, as we shift towards Industry 4.0, we need to ensure that no enterprise, no worker, no MSME or region is going to uh, be left behind. Okay, I think that uh, would conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Back to you. Thank you, Yusek Aldaba. You heard it right. The pandemic has brought us uh, the call for automation in our workplaces and probably also in our own households. Yusek, um, we are now going to show the results of the poll questions. You might want to give your insights considering your undertaking of MSME readiness to automation. Can we show now the results of the first poll, please? Okay, the first question was, what is your company's biggest automation challenge or hurdle? 35% answered cost of automation, 22% answered level of knowledge and skills, 15% answered weak or no access to technology or innovation, 19% said impact on employment, 9% answered others. Can we now show the second, the results of the second poll, please? So or if, this... Or if uh, I can, or will we uh, show how, these uh, slides again later? Uh, what is your pleasure, uh, Yusek? <laughs> Would you I like can, to answer yeah, immediately? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can, while uh, these are being shown, if I, I could just... Uh, react uh, um, right away. Uh, actually, uh, I really, when, when you showed the, the, the poll questions, I uh, was really uh, excited to see uh, what the findings would be and how uh, the responses would uh, 
uh, differ from the results that I've earlier shown. And uh, I think uh, this uh, very much uh, also captures the same. Can we go back to the first one, please? Please. Uh, we we're first in, yeah, they're, they're the first. very similar. Um, in fact, in terms of the most important, it's uh, cost of automation. And I uh, also mentioned earlier that uh, the top barrier, why companies are not adopting yet, although they are, the level of awareness is really quite high, but in terms of uh, the application, it's still very, very low. Um, but uh, again, um, it's due to uh, finance, uh, financial reasons. And uh, here we're seeing the same. It's the cost of automation, the 35% of uh, the audience uh, um, accounting for uh, this uh, highest uh, response. And of course, in terms of the others, uh, level of knowledge and skills, like what I've said earlier, though um, the level of awareness is quite high and uh, it's over 50%. Um, but uh, probably the, that level of awareness is still not th that deep um, that would uh, uh, really uh, enable them to shift uh, right away. So uh, like what I've said, uh, providing more information, um, having more, uh, um, I, I would suggest smaller sessions uh, with uh, different uh, uh, sectors. Um, in order to allow them to have uh, more uh, detailed, more specific uh, discussions that would also enable the respondents to ask uh, very detailed questions. Uh, um, probably sessions such as this would be useful. Um, but uh, then again, th we, we need to organize more uh, specific, more detailed, more technical um, Industry 4.0 uh, 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 webinars. And, by the way, we are going to uh, have one and uh, we'll conduct it together with uh, Siemens. And uh, um, I, I, I hope to invite the NWPC uh, uh, along with uh, your uh, stakeholders to uh, once we uh, conduct that seminar, that webinar. We still don't have the date, but uh, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, discussing this with, uh, with Siemens. Because number three, you have weak or no access to technology and innovation. And that's also the reason why we have uh, uh, those programs, the Industry 4.0 readiness programs that I uh, discussed uh, earlier. Um, we, we haven't started uh, uh, the pro those programs yet. And hopefully once the pandemic is, uh, or in the post pandemic, <laughs> in the new landscape, uh, we will be able to, uh, already implement uh, some of those uh, programs. Some are still in the um, um, research and uh, feasibility study stage. And hopefully by, by next year, we'll be able to uh, uh, start. Okay, impact on employment, it's 19%. And uh, that's also quite high. And uh, I guess that's the reason why we're also emphasizing human resource development, uh, the need for reskilling, the need for uh, retraining, as well as uh, uh, the need for us to provide uh, support uh, as we transition towards uh, the adoption of uh, these new te technologies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Thank, thank you, Yusek. And can we now please show the second poll results? The second question was, was what do you think are the benefits to your company of automating your processes? The highest pointer or the highest score goes to the answer, those that answered improve productivity, garnering 47%, and 40% answered speed up processes. Then, uh, 7% answered reduce costs and 4% answered improve product quality. 2% answered others. Okay. Can, we, can you give your thoughts, Yusek? Uh, again, uh, this is uh, uh, wonderful <laughs> in the sense that uh, um, the, the, the 
the results uh, being shown uh, are actually also um, aligned and they confirm the findings that uh, I've shown earlier. Um, we said uh, increasing in uh, competitiveness as the number one uh, factor in the um, survey uh, results that I also presented earlier. And here we're seeing improved uh, uh, productivity, which is at 47%, speed up uh, processes at 40%. And I, I would say uh, both are very much interrelated. If you speed up your process, that uh, actually would lead to an increase in your productivity, right? So, uh, um, yes, we are aligned and uh, our the audience is thinking in the same way as uh, the companies who responded to our survey. Thank you, Yusek, Fita. Can we now show the third poll results, please? The question was, at what stage of automation is your company in? 32% answered planning stage. 28% answered launched automation. 16% not started. Then 7% fully automated. 16% don't know or are uncertain. Yeah, I think you this say? also, yeah, this would also mirror the results. Uh, of our company, of our um, manufacturing survey. Although I don't know the composition of uh, the audience uh, today, but in terms of uh, the companies we surveyed, uh, they are uh, all coming from the various subsectors of uh, manufacturing. And um, in terms of the responses, again, um, um, what, what do we see? The highest is... Uh, 32% who are already plan in, in the planning stage. I think this is good. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether, um, whether um, these plans would be affected um, by the current crisis uh, that we are experiencing. And 28% already launched their automation. And I hope, uh, I hope the crisis, the pandemic would uh, not really going to affect your plans uh, substantially. But most of those I know uh, are still uh, pursuing their, their plans. So this is this actually, uh, like what I've said, this is good. Um, very small proportion, 7% 7, 7 who are uh, already fully automated. Um, again, this uh, is uh, aligned with what we've seen uh, earlier. And then, uh, of course, there are those uh, 16% who are uncertain. Uh, yeah, we, we are here and we're ready to, uh, to support you, to provide you with all the necessary information and to help you to um, also uh, plan to integrate these uh, new technologies in your, in your systems. Thank you, Yusek. Now we go to the the results of the third poll. Third. The question was, what forms of assistance do you need from government to jumpstart automation of your systems and processes? And there were multiple choices. 71% answered training, capacity building, 56% answered access to digital technology. 43% answered access to global markets and knowledge networks. And finally, 20% answered credit and loan assistance. Mm -hmm. You said, Yes, thank you, uh, Ruby. Uh, we didn't have uh, a question um, asking the companies the, the assistance that they would be needing from the government. But uh, we can infer actually from uh, the, uh, the responses that they gave to us. But this one is more direct. Um, so it's uh, training and capacity building, access to digital technology, and then access to global markets and uh, knowledge networks. 
Last is uh, only 20% said uh, they would need credit and loan assistance. But uh, note, however, that if we uh, try to relate your uh, needs with uh, the programs that um, I've earlier presented, they are actually uh, responding to uh, this uh, uh, assistance that uh, you've indicated in terms of uh, the, the, the uh, form of uh, governance support that you would be needing to help you transition towards Industry 4.0. So we, we have uh, training and capacity building. We, uh, we will have uh, programs to provide more access to uh, uh, Industry 4.0 technologies. And at the same time, uh, access to global markets and uh, knowledge networks, uh, we, uh, we that's actually a part of the regular tasks of uh, DTI and BOI. It's just that we need to really gear it more towards uh, knowledge networks and uh, um, access to uh, markets that are already strong in uh, the manufacturing of uh, these products, as well as how we could sell, how we could export these products or services to uh, this uh, global market. So it's very, very important. Um, and then credit and loan assistance. Apart from the loans and credits, we're also lining up uh, uh, some subsidies and, and grants uh, that would enable you to uh, um, quicken your pace of, uh, uh, or executing your plans right away. Thank, Thank you, Yusek. Yusek, Yusek Vita. Uh, Rubik, uh, if I may, uh, I, 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 I was browsing the Q&A and chat boxes, and we have several questions from our participants. Uh, Yusek Vita, can I start with a question from Executive Director C? Uh, she's, she's asking about the IQBS. Uh, if it is our roadmap uh, to fire, what is the timeline for implementation? How are we responding to the needs of uh, the industries, especially their automation cost concerns? Um, I have to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, Executive Director C. I didn't know that uh, you were you were here, but uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the timeline for the IQBS. Well. Um, uh, in, in, in ter well, IQBS of course um, covers a lot of uh, um, a lot of programs, a lot of activities. But in terms of the Industry 4.0 and the digital transformation that uh, we are focusing on, we're looking at uh, the next uh, uh, three years. Uh, the the plan is really to um, execute all of this uh, as soon as possible. It's just that. Uh, Right now, the consultants, because of uh, uh, travel restrictions, they couldn't come, and hence uh, the work on uh, the feasibility study on the establishment of an industry 4.0 um, uh, pilot factory, as well as uh, um, the, the SME Academy. These were uh, affected, but still we're able to communicate, but only virtually, um, and, and we're hoping that uh, once uh, travel restrictions have been um, lifted, then uh, we, we will be, the consultants would be able to resume their work. And in terms of uh, the uh, access to finance, um, like what I uh, presented earlier, the SMART uh, program, which uh, has uh, a component that would uh, provide access to finance, to soft loans, along with uh, grants and uh, other subsidies. But apart from this, uh, what uh, we uh, are uh, going to implement really is a comprehensive uh, program. So there's also going to be a training component and uh, um, access to markets, linking our uh, industries with uh, industries uh, abroad. Um, linking our uh, products our, uh, and our services with uh, the global value chains uh, in, uh, in other countries so that uh, 
um, the, the, the shift would uh, really uh, enable us to uh, increase our revenues and be able to generate uh, more jobs and uh, uh, help us uh, attain uh, higher growth, higher level of growth that is not only sustainable, but inclusive and uh, resilient. Thank you, Yusek. Uh, I have another question here from uh, Yusek uh, Rebecca Chato. Uh, she's asking about our readiness for Industry 4.0 with respect to HR component. Mom, uh, do we have a robust, from your point of view, do we have a robust supply of tech savvy or digitally innovative workforce at the moment? Yeah, I think so. In fact, uh... Um, I think that is one of the strengths of uh, the Philippines, our, um, our uh, human resources. And, uh, and then IT is also, again, another major strength of uh, the Philippines. And we could really leverage on these uh, strengths as we move towards the adoption of uh, um, Industry 4.0 and as we move towards uh, uh, digital uh, transformation. And we're uh, actually working together with uh, Dole as well as with uh, TESDA in terms of uh, formulating the Industry 4.0 Human Resource uh, Development Roadmap. And in this roadmap, uh, we uh, uh, are also going to uh, coordinate with uh, other uh, agencies such as CHED and DepEd. We've already um, signed uh, an MOU um, so that the uh, coordination and collaboration would be easier. And uh, we've been uh, having regular uh, meetings to discuss uh, um, the changes that would be needed in terms of uh, the curriculum in order to incorporate all these new skills um, that would be needed and prepare uh, our workforce, ensure that those companies that would be shifting to these new technologies, to digital transformation would uh, be uh, assured of uh, the skills uh, that uh, they would be needing. And at the same time, we are uh, also, we have also partnered with uh, Singapore, with uh, Singapore's uh, SSG, which is uh, the counterpart of uh, TESDA in, in, in Singapore. And we're, Singapore, of course, is already way, in, in terms of preparation, the preparations that they have done uh, for Industry 4.0, they're already way up high. <laughs> I mean, the problems that they've already addressed all the problems that we are addressing right now. And Singapore is uh, at a stage wherein they're trying to um, solve problems that uh, are not yet there, <laughs> trying to anticipate future problems and trying to prepare for uh, for these problems. But in any case, so we're learning a lot from uh, this partnership with uh, Singapore, the Skills Future Singapore. They've already um, created uh, the different uh, uh, training curricula um, as well as uh, um, programs uh, on various industries. And uh, I'm not saying that we are copying, copying exactly what uh, Singapore did in terms of all this uh, training and the skills uh, uh, programs, but there's so much to learn. There is so much that uh, we can apply, apply here and adapt based on the work, uh, very extensive work that uh, they've already uh, completed. And uh, I think uh, that somehow uh, makes it easier for us because there's, uh, uh, there are countries that uh, have already started uh, doing this. So um, it's, uh, um, I, I think, uh, one very good uh, partnership that uh, we have with uh, Singapore. And then we're also tapping the assistance of uh, other countries along with uh, international development partners who are also um, working towards uh, um, helping us reskill and upskill our workforce as we transition towards uh, uh, digital transformation. Thank you, Yusek. Uh, well, yeah, I, hope I, uh, I hope I was able to address uh, the question of uh, Mam Cha. Yusek Chato. Yusek yes, Chato. I have another very specific question here. Uh, 
would there be a possibility to recalibrate the comprehensive automotive resurgence strategy program to lower the target threshold in light of the pandemic as well as open more slots for other automotive players? Uh, if none, are there other proposed industrial policy strategies for the automotive sector? Um, yes. Um, I'm running out of battery if I could just <laughs> switch uh, very quickly. <laughs> Okay, because I thought I thought it was on. <laughs> Naka off pala yung aking ano. Um, okay, so um, for the cars program, uh, the cars program, um, there, there are two uh, participants that's Toyota and Mitsubishi, and whether there would be adjustments in the targets because of the pandemic, um, I think that is a very valid uh, reason. Um, for uh, adjustments to be made in terms of uh, the targets. So we're, we're uh, having a meeting, uh, I think that's uh, next week, precisely to discuss uh, all of these uh, new developments and how to uh, adjust uh, the program. And I think that's also one very good way by which uh, we could uh, support the survival as well as the economic recovery of uh, um, companies in the automotive industry. So um, definitely, yes, that's, uh, that's my uh, reply, uh, whether adjustments would be made considering that uh, uh, we are uh, experiencing this uh, pandemic and the economic crisis and recession. Um, and uh, I think there's another part to the question uh, you were asking about um, how this would further evolve or emerge yes, in, in, the, in, in the very near future. Well, of course, apart from the CARS program, we also have the ECO PUV uh, program. The support um, in this uh, uh, particular case is for um, Egyptnese, not only Egyptnese, but uh, um, we are supporting the uh, Jeepney modernization program of uh, uh, the DOTR. And uh, actually, for the CARS program, let me go back just so it would be clear. Um, the CARS program, uh, the, the budget for that um, uh, is good for three participants. But since uh, we only had two participants, so we still have the remaining, some remaining uh, budget. And we uh, transferred that budget for the implementation of the e ECO PUV program, which is going to provide the same support to uh, uh, modernize uh, the jeepney. So it would uh, uh, provide support to uh, jeepneys that would be shifting to Euro 4 or Euro 5, as well as those that would uh, uh, shift to uh, e-jeepneys. So there's, there's this support available, um, except that uh, we are not yet implementing it because we're still waiting for uh, its approval. There is an executive order that uh, uh, was drafted and it's uh, still with uh, um, Malacanang. So there's there, so there's a there's a program um, for uh, Egyptnese and uh, for Jeep, for modernizing the Egyptnese. And then another, um, I think I also need to share another very important program which is very much aligned with uh, digital transformation and Industry 4.0. And this is the electric vehicle um, incentive scheme. Um, we uh, are uh, preparing our industry for the future because the future of the auto is uh, it's going to be um, um, electric, it's going to be autonomous, it is um, going to be connected and shared you know, given, given all the uh, new technologies available. So that's um, the future of the auto industry. And if we're not going to prepare for that future, it will be difficult again for the Philippines to catch up if uh, um, there are no uh, programs in place that would enable us to uh, invest in this sector, prepare, um, ensure that the capacity, the manufacturing capacity for both uh, companies as well as for our workforce, if that capacity is not there, then uh, again, um, investors wouldn't come to uh, the country. And hence, uh, 
just to jumpstart, that is the idea behind this EVIS uh, program. It's really to provide the stimulus, to provide uh, uh, in some initial support to jumpstart the industry and attract investments towards uh, the, the creation of the electric vehicle uh, industry in, in the Philippines. Because right now, uh, definitely, there is still this um, uh, you, uh, price gap um, or price difference between uh, the traditional vehicle, uh, the internal combustion engine versus an EV, okay? So uh, in order for us to um, uh, create the market, create the demand for EVs, then we, we need to provide support that would address this uh, cost gap. Um, and that's actually uh, what the EVIS uh, program that I uh, was mention mentioning is going to do. It's going to provide um, subsidy to buyers of, uh, we're, we're focusing initially on uh, uh, public utility vehicles. Um, so uh, for drivers and for jeepney operators, for bus operators and uh, e-trikes and e-bikes. Uh, so that, that sub that there is a, a consumption uh, support that we will be providing to those uh, who will be um, procuring or buying this uh, EV uh, electric vehicles. And at the same time, to um, attract investors in the manufacturing of this uh, uh, EV products, we're also going to provide uh, support or fiscal transfers to those that would invest, particularly in those, uh, not only in assembly, but particularly for uh, those critical products where uh, we want the Philippines to play an important role in the battery, in the, charge, in the charging infrastructure uh, products, um, in the in the um, electronic uh, uh, electronic and digital components, uh, I think we are quite strong in those uh, sector. But again, we need to, we need this program in order to catalyze uh, uh, the development. Um, otherwise, waiting for uh, invest uh, until investors come, uh, and it, it, it would take. A lot of time so it's like a chicken and egg situation and in this uh, when in situations such as this I often say that uh, this could really be uh, a very um, well um, a, a situation a, a, this is um, a situation wherein you already need government to intervene and for government to provide a program to provide all the support that would uh, ensure that uh, the risks would be shared because people are people would be afraid like uh, um, I'm not so familiar with what, what this EV is or what an, what this e trike will do I, I, I might get burned or <laughs> it might cause a fire so all of the or it might stop in the middle of the road what to do so all of these apprehensions uh, and hence uh, what we're trying to do is not just to uh, provide the fiscal support but there would also be uh, non fiscal support in terms of uh, providing parking space in terms of the um, information, education, and awareness campaign for our uh, consumers. Um, and at the same time, um, more investments in R&D because like what I've said, this is a new area. Uh, this is a new market. And uh, of course, um, we're now operating under um, um, the industry for, uh, uh, under this new digital environment. And hence, we need to really uh, prepare uh, we need to have more R&D, we need to have more innovation, we need to have more uh, scientists such, uh, and, and uh, uh, at the same time also, I think I also need to mention the regulatory uh, aspects because this is an ecosystem that we're trying to build and each of us, each of the different government agencies and uh, the stakeholders would have a role to play. And we need to work together to ensure that uh, this is the, the, all these efforts won't be wasted and uh, all these efforts would bear fruits in terms of uh, a strong uh, EV, a new uh, industry such as the EV industry uh, wherein the Philippines could play uh, an important role and be part of uh, the global value chain. 
Thank you, Yusuf Frita. Uh, th there are so many more questions, but uh, unfortunately, we have very li uh, a very limited time. So we do apologize to, to our participants if uh, we cannot read all of your questions. Just, uh, Maybe, can you send those questions? Maybe yeah, if, you could send, yes, ma yes, ma if you could send the questions and uh, the email, email addresses of uh, uh, the, yeah, uh, of those who ask uh, these questions so uh, I can uh, reply to them personally. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we will forward all the questions from the participants so that uh, you, you could respond to them. Uh, but, ma'am, uh, just for one, uh, uh, I'd, I'd just like to read this message from our executive director. Uh, the NWPC is interested to partner with you in the implementation of programs under strategy, strategy number two of IQS that is on developing innovative SMEs and startups. Thank you, Yusek, for accommodating our request to feature you in our, on our webinar series. So, thank you, Yusek Fita. Always a pleasure. Uh, I think I'm I'm uh, I'm always present in all the <laughs> webinars of uh, NWPC. Ruby, thank you very much, Yusek. And at this point, in behalf of the National Wages and Productivity Commission, I would like to express our gratitude to Undersecretary Rafaelita M. Aldaba for the presentation on automating workplaces in a better normal. Thank you to all the participants. Yusek, can you uh, just leave some few words to inspire our MSMEs to automate their systems and processes? Please. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Of, thank you very much. I mean, um, it's... Uh, um, always a pleasure to uh, uh, share um, the activities, the plans, and the programs of uh, the DTI. Like what I've said, um, our approach um, has always been uh, um, colla strong collaboration with uh, not, not only within the government, but with uh, academe, with industry, with civil society, with our workers, and uh, all the stakeholders. And um, re rest assured that uh, we are really doing our best to uh, support uh, the, the, our, our industries, particularly our small, our micro, small and medium enterprises, but as well as the large, because the large uh, enterprises also need uh, um, some support. Of course, the, the, that uh, support would uh, differ um, quite a bit, but uh, we're doing, like what I've said, we're exerting all efforts trying to find the budget, the necessary budget that would enable us to implement uh, all these pro programs that uh, I've uh, presented to you. The SMART program, uh, the Industry 4.0 uh, plans, um, the uh, pilot, Industry 4.0 pilot factory, and uh, SME Academy where uh, all these Industry 4.0 trainings would take place. But um, even, 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 even though these uh, uh, facilities are not there yet, we are working together with PESDA, we are working together with uh, PTTC, which is the training arm of uh, the department, in terms of uh, uh, the industry 4.0 um, training uh, courses that we would like to uh, offer to you. Um, and in fact, even in test, the new training uh, programs are being uh, uh, conceptualized and discussed and to be offered soon, just to make sure that uh, our uh, workforce would be ready and that we will uh, be able to have all this uh, retraining and upskilling training programs uh, to, to ensure that uh, we will be ready uh, for Industry 4.0. So once again, thank you, thank you all so much, and I hope uh, I hope to see you again next year. Or or I will I will be inviting you to the Industry 4.0 uh, seminar. Uh, it, it's a technical technical uh, uh, webinar uh, that we will be having together with uh, Siemens, where mm -hmm. where where um, explanations and uh, um, w would be provided. Really, uh, they would dwell on. 
the technical technical aspects of uh, all these uh, new technologies how do you uh, digitalize your your factory uh, how do you create a digital twin i, I mean those are the uh, kinds of uh, uh, topics that uh, we uh, uh, in we uh, are envisioning uh, in that uh, webinar so thank you thank you all so much and uh, please uh, uh, let's all stay safe and uh, keep well. Thank you. Thank you again, Yusek Fita. We'll be looking forward to your invitation. Yeah. Well, join us uh, again on September 17 when we discuss technology-enabled solutions, mitigation to recovery. September 24, Future of Work in a Healthier and More Resilient Environment. October 1, Employment Outlook, Transitioning to a Better Normal. October 8, Actionable Intelligence, Results Amid Uncertainty. October 15, Business Reconfiguration, Leading Practices, Transitioning to the New Normal. October 22, Employee Engagement, Leading Practices, Transitioning to the New Normal. And on November 5, automation, leading practices, transitioning to the new normal. For more information, please visit our official website at www.nwpc.dollar.gov.ph. Before you leave, kindly fill up the evaluation form and let us know how else we can improve our future webinars through your valuable feedbacks. I'm Richard Valenzuela. And I'm Ruby Badilies. Thank you again for joining us today and we will see you next week.